everybody. It's a real treat to have Doug Bieber with us today and especially to speak in this series. Uh, Doug, without further ado, tell us about Living Many Histories. Okay, awesome. Uh, thank you for the invite, Sri and Orit. And uh, my name is Doug or Douglas Weibel. And um, what I wanted to do was to put together a story which I, which I was asked to, to craft and realizing that sometimes these can be like retrospectively selective, I tried to um, balance it. So you'll hear, you'll hear some ups and downs, you'll think, hear about things that worked well and some warts and growing pains and mistakes and, and there have certainly been many of those. Um, okay. Uh, th this is a, a quick like roadmap of where I've been. Um, and really the thing to point out is that I started at the point shown in uh, number one, which is on the East Coast. I was born in Philadelphia. And I've ended up in 13, uh, which is outside of Seattle. And I'll tell you about the path uh, that I took to get there, uh, which I would call my career arc. Uh, you'll see I bounced around quite a bit. Um, you know, I think career part, paths more often than not are, are really a bit of a random walk, and that was certainly the case for myself. Um, I was born in Philadelphia, and when I was eight, uh, we moved to Connecticut, and I grew up in a relatively rural town. Um, I was fortunate in the sense that uh, I had siblings, so I have three awesome siblings. I've got great parents, um, and our family had a farm in Iowa, family farm. And uh, I was grateful that we spent a few number of summers actually out there uh, when we were young. And so you can see some of these pictures here on the left um, from when I was a kid. Uh, farms are amazing because your curiosity can really just uh, roam and you can do all sorts of things that are dangerous and, uh, and, and probably not uh, legal that uh, you, you can't do in, in urban areas. Um, and so I had a lot of uh, really great experiences growing up uh, connected to this farm. Now, in addition to our family owning a farm, our family also had a lab. So there's this picture on the right. You know, I tried to pick an embarrassing picture. Uh, this is like a teenage picture. I've got a little wisp of hair growing on my upper lip there. And I've got these headphones on. And I think it's because there's a, there's a, um, an instrument in the background uh, that uh, generates like uh, uh, ultrasound and um, ultrasonic waves, excuse me. And, and so, I, you know, I've, I must have mixed something up and that's what I have in my hand. It looks like a milkshake. Um, but my myself and my uh, siblings grew up, we spent some time as teenagers in the lab and uh, kind of cut our teeth early. My father was or is a chemist and I tried very hard to distance myself from chemistry. My older brother also became a chemist, which made me really double down on avoiding chemistry. But I think you're going to see that these uh, efforts were in vain, despite my best uh, intentions. Um, when I graduated from high school, so, so first of all, I wasn't a particularly motivated uh, student in high school in terms of academics. I was very motivated in terms of uh, skateboards and snowboards and girls. Um, but when I graduated, I was not motivated to go to college, and I did what I think now would be referred to as a gap year, but at the time was referred to as like, you know, probably a bad decision. And I, uh, I took a year off, and I actually ended up living in southern Indiana on a very small farm, organic farm, by myself, largely, and um, had a just an amazing uh, experience uh, with a lot of space to to read and think and um and i grew a lot of the food i ate um it was quite transformational my a lot of the neighbors were amish so i got to be friends with amish and and actually um almost ended up staying there and uh um spending a lot of time with the amish but i i took a detour and i uh, eventually ended up at the university of utah and as an undergrad I enrolled, I think, when I summer two thousand three, and as a physics major. And so I had I had worked on a bunch of enzymes as a teenager. I was really interested in enzymes and kinetics, and thought biophysics would be very interesting. So I 
decided that I would go into physics. And the first semester went uh, quite well. The second semester went okay. And, and I found myself on like a downward spiral in physics where I, I could do well, I could do fine, but I, I really had to struggle. And it wasn't as intuitive as I would have liked. And, and it clearly wasn't as intuitive as it was for all my uh, friends uh, that were studying physics and were Eastern European and just were like light years ahead of me. Um, so, uh, so despite efforts to kind of take my own path away from chemistry, I actually ended up in chemistry. Um, and I ended up there because it was just very intuitive. Um, there are things that I, I just felt like I intrinsically knew. Uh, I, I grew to enjoy it. Um, over the, th the time I was there, I spent three years in the lab of Dale Poulter, who's shown on the bottom left of the slide, who is a chemistry professor. So I, uh, I was enrolled in chemistry. And I started there working on enzymes and ended up working on um, synthetic chemistry. And um, yeah, I had, a, I had a really terrific time. Uh, University of Utah is a great place uh and you know it's in a beautiful location and so whenever we weren't in the lab or in classes we would be outside playing i think the for me the biggest win at uh utah was i met my awesome wife gina who's uh shown in the uh upper right of the slide um after graduating i, I moved to japan for a year to do research in chemistry i worked for yoshinori yamamoto who is a well-known chemist he's shown in the top right of the slide um at a large national university called Tohoku. Um, and when he invited me out, he said, hey, why don't you come out and work on the synthesis of a very large uh, complicated molecule called hemibrevitoxin B, which is, is produced by the dinoflagellates that uh, are responsible for the red tide. It's a neurotoxin, uh, we're gonna make it and then biologists are gonna use it to understand how the molecule works. And when I got out, there, he, he basically said, hey, it's great to see you. Oh, and by the way, um, this project's been finished. And so instead, uh, why don't you work with this associate professor in, in my lab, uh, Vladimir Govorgan, who showed on the bottom left. And, uh, and I did, and I spent a year, uh, a really amazing year working together with him on uh, homogeneous catalysis. So kind of organometallic chemistry. Um, and so at this point, I'm highly embedded in chemistry, uh, no, no sight on the horizon in terms of going back. And um, when I returned, Gina and I both moved out to Ithaca, where we went to Cornell. I was in chemistry, Gina was in material science and engineering. And um, I worked on organic chemistry research with Jerry Meinwald, who was turned out to be a tremendous role model. Um, and I learned a lot from him. He was also extremely supportive. And I think one of the big take homes for me in working with him was first, he was super hands off. I think he came in the lab like four or five times the whole time I was there. And he was, um, he was very passionately supportive of the people he worked with. And a good example of that was in, I think my second year, uh, Gina's advisor coordinated, it, coordinated with a, a collaborator for her to go out to Dresden to work on a polymer research project. And um, so my advisor, when he found that out, he said, oh, well, we'll have to get you set up. So he picked up the phone and called and set up a summer intern position for me at the Max Planck Institute for Chemical ecology working with this gentleman shown here, Wilhelm Boland, working on bioorganic chemistry. So here I've kind of started moving towards, uh, uh, migrating towards bio a bit more. And I'm going to skip this. And then two years later, as part of a fellowship I was on, I was required to do an internship. And I, at that time, had I was getting closer to the end of my program and had spent a lot of time talking to Gina about what she was working on, which was very uh, engineering oriented. And I started getting in, very interested in engineering. I took some courses, um, microfabrication was starting to gain a lot of momentum and I, I wanted to learn more about that. So I um, was fortunate that my advisor again 
stepped up for me and helped me uh, set up an internship at a company called Orchid, which was a company that was building a genotyping platform for a uh, single nucleotide polymorphism detection and had been a really early adopter of microfluidics. And I, I spent a summer there uh, in Princeton, New Jersey, living on campus and, and working at this interesting startup. Um, I didn't know what I wanted to do at the end of graduate school. I, I oscillated like mad between academics and industry. And in fact, uh, it was the periodicity of that oscillation was like probably biweekly. My friends started calling me the flopper because I was so indecisive. And um, I eventually realized, hey, I can put the decision off. I'll just go do a postdoc. Uh, I can go from a postdoc to industry. I can go from a postdoctoral position to academia. And so I was very fortunate. I, I joined the lab of uh, George Whitesides at Harvard. And um, I was there for three years, actually three and a half years. And I, while I came into a chemistry department, I barely worked on chemistry. I used it as a survival skill. But I primarily worked on engineering and, and biology projects uh, with a little sprinkle of physics. And a lot of that was enabled by the many collaborations between George's lab and faculty all across campus and beyond. Um, and that, that really kind of opened up my world of what I would call physical biology, which was using the physical sciences and engineering to study um, biology. At some point, I think it was 2015, I was in uh, Maha's office and I noticed a book. I, I, I was really interested in, in insects when I was younger and he had a copy of this well-known insect physiology book called Wait from this uh, Cambridgean uh, Wigglesworth. And so we started talking about that and, uh, and our, our interest in physiology. And he said, hey, you know, if you're interested in physiology, you should really go to Woods Hole for the summer. I think it's going to totally blow your mind. Uh, I think you're going to learn a lot. It's, it's going to help you as you're starting at your career in terms of finding interesting uh, projects to work on. And I applied and, and was fortunate to do that in 2015 in the summer. And, um, and it was, it was a, it was an awesome summer. I learned a lot of uh, interesting new techniques, but I think what was more important to me, um, in addition to learning lots of, uh, in, or finding a lot of interesting people and learning from them. Um, I kind of got glued at that point onto the intersection of biology with uh, engineering. Um, I started faculty position at uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison in 2006. My primary appointment was in biochemistry. So you can see I'm not even on the same track as, as, my, um, as my degrees, but I think, you know, you know, I wasn't a biochemist per se, but it's kind of like, hey, I figured as long as they were paying me, they could call me whatever they wanted. Um, a lot of the projects that we ended up working on over the next 10 to 12 years were studying very basic questions about bacteria, um, thinking about phenomena such as mass transport, diffusion, molecular contact, et cetera. Later, we started bridging into um, applied projects, things that provided the ability to like see a really quick kind of real world impact. And that, that really got me excited about uh, applied science. Um, and, and you'll see how that played. Yeah. So sorry to jump in, but you have a couple of minutes max. Okay, I, I have two slides. Um, I, I later was uh, appointed in chemistry and biomedical engineering. Um, and what I found was that there were a lot of people on campus to work with, a lot of people that were interesting um, to collaborate with, a lot of interest in the areas that we were working on and, and some of the tools that we built. But, um, oh, and, and I, I wanted to pay uh, homage to the Aspen Center for Physics. So I, we were very fortunate um, over many summers to be able to go out to Aspen and uh, hang out with physicists, learn about the way that they think about problems and uh, collaborate with them. Even though we weren't physicists, um, we found a lot of common ground and uh, a lot of common uh, projects to work on together. 
And then the applied stuff really led to moving outside of the university. I, I ended up spending a year at Google. I went back to Madison. I ended up spending a year at Amazon. I went back to Madison. And then I left uh, for good to Amazon, where I've been uh, since uh, coming up on some something like six to seven years. And finally, you know, I want to just do a couple of takeaways. So I think there are lots of different ways to a career. There are a lot of different paths. Why go through the same small door that everyone else goes to? Maybe try the back gate. Um, academics is all about people. Focus on your customers. We all have had these amazing opportunities, and uh, I think we have the responsibility to pay it forward, providing those opportunities for other people. Um, you know, I think it's important to see to pay attention to what other people are doing, but I think avoiding comparisons is a very healthy thing to do. Um, find the things that you're excited about and explore them. I wouldn't worry about what other people think about what you're doing. Uh, competitions distracting. When someone tells you uh, that's not going to work, I think you should double down and try it even harder. Um, you know, I think pay attention to what people are doing. You can learn a lot. Uh, have fun. Learn to say no. And I think you know the important thing is like learn how to manage. Like we never get training in management, but management is is super critical to to what we do. And then I think the last thing is never lose touch of what's most important to you, and uh, make sure you're carving out time uh, to to focus on that and and like creating lines in the sand of protecting your time. So you can think very proactively, focus on the things that are critical and uh, not just focus on the reactive. And that's it. Thanks so much, Doug, uh, for your living history talk. Floor is open, uh, clapping on behalf of everybody. If anybody wants to jump in with burning questions. I have a Go for it. Random question. Uh, in the first part of your talk, you, you mentioned where the house you grew up in, you had a chemistry lab in your house. And it made me wonder, how does one go about building a lab <laughs> in, in your house? Um, well, I said, that... I, I said our family had a lab. I didn't say where it was. Oh, OK. I thought it was <laughs> where you lived, which would be very convenient. So sorry, never mind. It did turn out to be where we lived, um, but yeah. So how does one do that? Um, yeah, I think, you know, it helps to have a business and to have the business be the driving, um, the like the driving function to getting equipment and the things that you need to do research. Yeah. Got it. Thanks. Um, Ali, do you want to go for it? Yeah, so I wanted to ask you about the move to Amazon. So what, you've done a lot of research over the years and I wasn't sure that like, Amazon would be interested in hiring people like from our background. Like, how is it, are you doing research though? Or is there, or it's mainly move, you move to completely different things? Well, I've definitely moved in different areas. Um, and, and I'm certainly not doing anything that's really close to what I've done in the past. Um, you know, I would say when I came research here, R&D was really D. It was really all about development. And, and um, over time, the research component grew. It grew primarily in the area of, of ML. Um, but I think more recently, uh, COVID, for example, has scrambled what it means to do R&D. And um, for example, Amazon last year stood up uh, its own testing its own COVID testing and created labs to do this and ran many, many, many tests. Um, I think over time, we're gonna see tech companies uh, probably dive deeper into some of these areas that they're not traditionally known for and to figure out how to combine those with things that they are really good at doing to solve hard problems. I see. And may uh, I ask go, go for it. May I ask what kind of uh, research problems you are working on now, like more specifically? Um, I don't, so I don't work on research per se, um, but I'm, I'm working on some stuff and just uh, stay tuned. <laughs> I'd love to tell you about it when it, when it becomes uh, live. Yeah, sure. All right, uh, Doug, I feel like even though we're running a couple of minutes late, I can't let you go without asking you a challenging question. Um, uh, so, so how about this one? Um, 
you know, I know you value intellectual curiosity, integrity, and all that stuff. And, you know, many of us are lucky to find one place where we can have all that. And you have moved through like so many different communities besides having an amazing advisor who made dreams come true. Like what's your secret? What's my secret? Um, I, I think it's, you know, there's a, there's a bit of luck there, but I, I think, um, I think, you know, the key is just following what you're excited about and uh, just working hard to see if you can get something to work out. And someone once told me, uh, this guy, Dan Kelly, I worked with at Google. He said, this guy had the most interesting career trajectory of like all time and was a physicist, but it started like uh, doing auto body work, like painting cars and stuff, just amazing guy. His philosophy was like, whenever you come to a fork in the road and you, you have to, you have to choose, choose a crazier thing. And I think he's totally right. Um, you know, it, it'll be interesting. There'll never be a dull day. You're going to be on a steep learning curve. Um, you know, if it doesn't work out and you're and you're adept at what you do and you work hard, you'll find something else. So, so I've I've really embraced that. I, I think it's the sage advice. On that super high note, thank you so much, Doug. Everybody, your hands together again. Um, with that, I am ending the recording and opening the floor for informal discussion.